Yeah, yeah maybe Bjorn, you want to hand off? Uh, well, I should probably yeah. introduce Bjorn if somebody don't know. He's a a historian uh, of note uh, who's who's documented uh, much of the war sailors in his PhD thesis. Um, and uh, uh, it's a thesis I waited my whole life for because <laughs> it put down the stories I had been told since I was a little boy. And uh, so he, he works now for this archive, and I'll let him maybe talk a little bit about his work. But we are really happy to have him today to do this. Bjorn, you want to start? Bjorn Tori, you want to start? Yeah, we'll start on the way we'll do it together. I <laughs> I believe uh, we have made this presentation together, um, the four of us. Uh, so I will start sharing my screen just to see if everything works. Do you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Looking good. Good. Um, and let's hope uh, all the technical issues is on our side uh, today. Well, um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, meeting today. And <clears throat> I will try to bring some of my work into this, but I also look forward to hear um, John and Phil um, and Hank um, tell Tell me and um, us about um, the war sailor uh, history, both during the war and after the war as well in Brooklyn in particular. But we'll start with um, start with uh, today and the current movies that are really making people aware of the war sailors not only in Norway, I believe, but also in America. I've, I've uh, noticed that uh, Atlantic Crossing wasn't particular about the war sailors, but um, there was one scene at least concerning a war sailor. Um, Greyhound uh, with Paul Hanks um, made uh, a lot of people aware of the importance of the Battle of the Atlantic. And uh, in 2022, uh, the film War Sailor came on Norwegian cinemas and next year went to Netflix. And this has really made Norwegian seafarers uh, and this, their story uh, bring, they brought their story all around the world uh, through Netflix. And, I don't know if anybody of you have seen it, but um, I think it was a really good film. Uh, I was also a historical consultant on this movie, which I really believed uh, took the history very seriously uh, when making this film. And uh, uh, last year, last Christmas, uh, this new movie came on Norwegian cinemas, Convoy which I believe soon will be on American cinemas as well. And um, this is a movie inspired by the very famous convoy PQ-17, uh, which uh, was a convoy which really turned out to be one of the worst disasters of the Second World War from the Allied point of view, militarily. Uh, and this followed one ship uh, through this convoy. And I hope you will be able to see that movie as well. I think when I often start my presentation about the war sailors um, by this map, because I think this map really tells a lot about the, the global part and the global influence uh, the war sailors and the Norwegian merchant fleet had at the start of the Second World War. It was the fourth largest fleet in the world. Um, and it was uh, not only traveling in Europe, but it was going um, on routes everywhere. So when the war started, and also in April 1940, when Germany occupied Norway, these ships were located all around the world. And the great question was then, uh, what should they do? And I believe uh, possibly one of the biggest achievements from the Norwegian government um, 
who were hunted by the German invaders when they held a governmental meeting in uh, in Romstal uh, near Dombos here on, in this uh, house they decided to um, requisition all the Norwegian merchant ships into one state-owned shipping company and this is called Nortra ship and this made Nortra ship the biggest uh, shipping company in the world it also made Norwegian ship carry on sailing with Norwegian flag and also getting an income to the Norwegian government in exile which um, went to London as you may know and this also gave the government in exile both political influence and also economic strength to um, look after uh, Norwegians in exile, building up a navy, army, and uh, air defense, but also have money when the war was over. So this was really, really important. But it was not really only important for the Norwegians. It was much more important was the fact that the Norwegian merchant uh, fleet had uh, uh, a vital importance for the outcome of the Second World War. It was, I think all Norwegian historians have agreed that this was Norway's most important contribution during the Second World War. And most importantly, I think, was transporting oil because Norway had the most modern tank fleet when the war started. And especially before the USA entered the war, December 1941, um, it was crucial for the Norwegian tankers to get to uh, Great Britain. If not, they would possibly not have managed to, to fight alone, as Churchill said. Uh, this poster says that 40% of the oil was carried on Norwegian tankers. I believe in the autumn of 1940, it was up to 50% of all the oil to Britain was transported on Norwegian ships. So this was really, really important. But then remember, the ships was not able to sail without the crew. And it was the crew that I am most concerned with, both in my research, but also uh, when I have presentations and when I speak with you today. Help. Yeah. So these are um, some notable uh, quotes from uh, British uh, figures, including a British admiral who said, if it wasn't for the Norwegian Merchant Marine, we might as well have asked Hitler for his terms. Um, uh, one of the most prominent Norwegian resistance fighters also uh, credited uh, probably the Norwegian Merchant Fleet as being one of the most uh, important contributions Norway made to the Allied war effort. Um, and then uh, we have a another quote from uh, Philip Noel Baker, who uh, eventually was uh, Great Britain's Minister of Fuel and Power on their, their transportation uh, ministry. And um, and he said, if we had not the fleet of Norwegian tankers on our sides, uh, we we basically wouldn't have been able to put uh, gas in the uh, airplanes that fought uh, the Battle of Britain. So I think the next slide will actually have a video of, of this quote and expanding on it a little more. So next slide, see if this works. Britain and the Allies would have lost the war. The first great defeat for Hitler was the Battle of Britain. It was a turning point in history. If we had not had the Norwegian tankers on our side, we should not have had the aviation spirit to put our Spitfires and our Hurricanes into the sky. 
The Germans could have invaded Britain and there might have been no base from which the Nazis could have been defeated. The Norwegian merchant navy rendered immense service to the world at that time. Yeah, and uh, when I did my PhD thesis about uh, how the both Norwegian and foreign seafarers, uh, their service was ensured uh, on Norwegian ships, uh, this was one of my important uh, quotes, which I have used because joint allied actions meant that each ally will be able to say that its manpower policy was an allied policy for winning the war. And this is important to understand how uh, the seafarers uh, were mobilized. It was done in a cooperation between the allies, close cooperation. And this it's important also to notice here that this was important to actually win the war. They had to cooperate to have enough manpower. And this next quote is also uh, underlining the same thing that a sufficient supply of officers and ratings uh, that victory depended on uh, an answer to that question to have a sufficient supply of crew members and I don't think that very many people know that uh, winning the second world war to win the second world war uh, enough seafarers was a uh, crucial question to handle in that respect. When I did my PhD, I, I did a very interesting finding and that it was this quote that I found in British archives, which says that um, Churchill was, Winston Churchill, the prime minister of Great Britain, was very concerned in the summer of 1940 because it was strikes and unrest among Norwegian seafarers, which uh, stopped ships, especially from going from New York to Liverpool with uh, fuel and steel. And this was extremely worrying for the prime minister. And after he um, wrote this letter, his uh, assistant, uh, I found very strong proof that a lot of both sticks and carrots were provided to the Norwegian seafarers to have them sailing. The sticks was both could be the possibility to arrest and detain seafarers that did not sail, and the carrots was to give the Norwegian seafarers far better uh, payment than the British seamen. That was the very short version. Yeah. Yo, no. Could you say something about the role? Yes. So this is uh, a short summary of the contribution of Norwegian's merchant fleet. Some of it we've already uh, talked about that uh Norway's merchant fleet was over 1100 ships um 40 percent of the world's independent oil tanker fleet were Norwegian flag vessels there were about there were well more than 30,000 uh uh seamen at the time <coughs> there were an additional 3200 foreigners that were also on the a ship I think it's also important to recognize that Norway was involved in World War II almost from the start. Um, during the phony war period, uh, 55 Norwegian merchant ships were uh, sunk to U-boat attacks and about 400 seamen lost their lives even before Germany invaded Norway. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning that every Norwegian merchant ship captain refused to uh, go back to Norway if they were in international waters. If you remember that slide with all the flags all over the world, um, they didn't go back to Norway, but they eventually all 
somehow serve the allied cause. Um, one of the um, uh, items that uh, came up was what to do with all these uh, uh, merchant seamen. Um, if they couldn't go back to, to Norway and uh, there was a camp established in Nova Scotia to start uh, uh, training some of these seamen who wanted to serve as gunners to protect the ships from German attack. Um, so that's my father was was there on uh, two occasions. Um, and I'm sure that there are other people, maybe even on this call, who's whose uh, father might have been up there as well, or on Traverse Island near the Bronx for gunnery training. Um, but the high cost um, uh, to Norway was great because it was a loss of over 700 ships, uh, both in its home fleet and international fleet. And there were over 3,600 Norwegian merchant seamen and a hundred, uh, I mean, a uh, thousand foreigners that were uh, killed as uh, part of uh, the World War II effort. So it represents one of the highest proportional casualty rate out of any allied uh, armed service unit. Next slide. So I thought I'd put together a big picture of um, what the sacrifice uh, meant uh, year by year. So you see the first two columns, that was the phony war time period uh, where the number of uh, ships and, and men were lost. I have it both by number of ships and tonnage and then the um, yellow line, I think, is probably the most important, is the number of seamen who uh, died uh, during a World War II. So you see that there is a big spike up in, in, in 1942. Um, and then by that time, as you get in towards the end of 1942 and into 43, you're getting a, a better convoy system established that's uh, protecting allied lives and also uh, allies breaking the Enigma code of the Germans. Um, so that helped. But if you notice towards the end, there is a little spike in the number of ships uh, sunk by allied forces of the Norwegian home fleet. Those are the ships that were caught in Norwegian territorial waters and were used by the Germans. So you see a little uh, uh, spike in the number of ships sunk then. <clears throat> I guess next slide. So uh, what I thought I would do is um, illustrate, um, you know, the sacrifice that these uh, men made uh, and the ships. It was particularly hazardous off uh, Cape Hatteras in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this video here, I you can you can Bill, start. Just one quick point. For many years, the Norwegian government held memorial services in the Outer Banks, uh, which is commemorating what you're about to show us, I think. Uh, yes. Some of the Norwegian ships were lost out there. And I think, John, uh, one of the ships um, your your father uh, was torpedoed on was off Cape Hatteras. The Blink, yes, the Blink, 1942. One of the really interesting things about this area is that when people think of where World War II came home to the United States, they think of Pearl Harbor and the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, but really the place that it came most consistently to the United States was along the Outer Banks and along the East Coast, and people aren't really aware of that. We were just so isolated, it was very easy to, to keep this a secret here. And these people were told, don't talk about it, and don't write about it, and, and uh, they were good soldiers and, and they followed the rules. When the United States entered the war, a lot of the sort of naval threat was perceived to be in the Pacific Ocean, so the bulk of the U.S. fleet was, was designated to operate in the Pacific, which left uh, the East Coast largely unprotected. The U-boats had quite an advantage where they weren't really resisted initially until the United States had such a time that they could build up fleet forces for a two-ocean war. 
one of the main reasons for targeting Cape Hatteras is because of the shipping lanes and the Gulf Stream primarily. If you have merchant vessels that are running you know, from south to north, they're trying their best to stay in the Gulf Stream because it's, it's an underwater highway. It'll actually you know, give you a few knots of speed. Hatteras was far enough south and in the middle of two major Navy and military installations. I guess the Germans considered it was an area they could operate close to the coast and not be so close to a, a military installation. It became a good spot for U-boats to hunt because of the way that the continental shelf comes so close to shore. The shipping lanes were still going over the shelf, but the U-boats could get out uh, into deeper water to hide, which was their primary defense. So for these reasons, the, uh, the U-boats kind of really preferred to hunt in this area. During the war years, uh, we could hear the explosions when, particularly tankers, when they were torpedoed, you could hear those explosions. And uh, we'd go over to the beach, and one Sunday we went out, and actually uh, at that particular Sunday, there were three tankers burning at one time out there, all within sight of the beach. You could see the, in some cases, the flames, others you could see the, just the black smoke rising. My aunts told me about climbing up on the roof of the house that I inherited at night and watching the ships burn, see the glow of the ships, the people would hear them, the windows would rattle, they'd see the light, the fires, and they would actually begin to have, you know, kind of like little prayer meetings and concerns and things. And, and even, the, even the people that were retired Coast Guardmen at the time, or, or the local people, would go to the beach, maybe patrol the beaches, and look for survivors and things. Everybody helped. Go to the next slide. Um, so I think a couple of years ago, uh, we had a program where I talked more detail about, um, my father's uh, specific service, but here is like just a short, uh, one slide about it. Uh, so on the left is a photo of my father as part of his uh, British identity papers. Um, he needed, he was in England, uh, while awaiting a new ship assignment. So he was on shore for about three months. So here he is all about uh, uh, 21 years old. Um, probably the only uh, suit and tie <laughs> that he ever owned at the time. But anyway, he served on uh, five ships. Um, uh, three of them were sunk in the months after he signed off them. Um, he, he found out uh, Norway was invaded while they were taking on a, a load of oil in Aruba. Um, so he knew then that he couldn't go back to his home country. Um, uh, fourth ship he served on during a convoy run from Halifax to England, uh, almost uh, foundered because of a very heavy winter uh, storm. So it wasn't just U-boats, uh, but uh, that they had to contend with, but it was also the weather. Um, and the, the ship made, captain made a decision actually to go back to Halifax because the ship was so damaged. Then it made another voyage again, um, but it could barely keep up with the convoy um, because the ship's engine wasn't designed to go uh, that fast. And so when it got to England, um, it needed some parts from Sweden, because the ship was built originally in Sweden, and it took a several month period uh, for those um, parts to come. In the meantime, then he decided to go back to Halifax on another ship, and then he was, the ship was leaving Southampton Harbor, and it got caught in one of those uh, B-decker raids of the German uh, Luftwaffe. So the ship had to hide in some cove while the bombing raid was going on. Uh, he made it back to um, Halifax and went to Camp Norway, began his gunnery training, and then he unfortunately caught a very uh, life-threatening case of uh, pneumonia, and he he almost died, but uh, and there was uh, a six, eight-month period where he had to go to a Canadian hospital every Saturday morning to have his 
lung strain with fluid. Uh, he went to a recuperation hospital in Canada and then was transferred to one in the Catskills. And there he um, linked up with the uh, doctors from the Norwegian Public Health Service that operated in Manhattan. And uh, there he learned that they needed help with um, uh, office duties uh, so that the doctors and the nurses wouldn't be uh, inundated with doing, you know, maintaining appointments and all. So that's where he started his career with the Norwegian Public Health Service in 1944. And he, and he stayed there until they, they closed the office in the early 70s. Uh, I think would be next slide. So now it's, I think, up to head. And if everyone could, uh, who's uh, watching, if they could mute so that we can hear the speaker, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Yeah, my, uh, I'm Henry Grimsland, Hank Grimsland, and my dad, like many of you, uh, many of your fathers, um, was a Krieg sailor, Norwegian war sailor. Uh, he trained at age 17 uh, to be a seaman on the Stadsrad Lemkul, which is a, most of you know, is a famous uh, training ship. Um, and he was assigned uh, as a able seaman in uh, March of 1939 on the oil tanker Devanga. The Devanga became a part of the, um, the merchant uh, fleet that uh, supplied the allies with oil. Um, so on April 9th, 1940, my dad was 21 years old. And of course, that's when Germany occupied Norway, invaded Norway. Um, he was, uh, part of a convoy, his ship was part of a convoy that went from Curacao to Nova Scotia. And they joined uh, with uh, about 59, 60 other ships on that convoy. And so now I'm gonna read his testimony, uh, his written account of uh, what happened on that convoy. We were part of a 60 ship convoy from Halifax, Nova Scotia on our way to Liverpool, England. On the night of October 11th, we were the first ship in the convoy to be hit by a torpedo. Four men were able to launch one of the two lifeboats. The other lifeboat was damaged in the blast. He said, I jumped overboard with my heavy boots on and I swam towards the lifeboat. It was very hard swimming as the sea was rough. Thankfully, I was able to make it to the lifeboat. We headed east and began rowing very hard. The sea was rough and the vessel was small. I was not a praying man, but I know my mother was praying for me, which after the war, she said, I prayed for you every day. They were on the lifeboat for seven days, finally reaching uh, the coast of Ireland near the town of Broadhaven, County Mayo, which is nice because it's St. Patrick's Day, right? We can thank the Irish for... Uh, for their assistance. Um, some people were on the mountainside, some of the Irish residents of that town were on the mountainside and they came out with their tar paper boat and assisted us in getting to shore. Of course, they were exhausted, covered with black crude oil. And he said, I felt great finally being rescued. However, as soon as I got out of the lifeboat, I fell down. His legs were not used to walking. The Irish people were very kind. They fed us tea and sandwiches, and then they were transported to the local hospital to recuperate. Um, and a funny thing he said, you know, they were covered with crude oil. So the medical staff, when they, after washing the crude oil off, they were surprised to find that they were blonde haired, blue eyed Norwegians. Um, after uh, recuperating, he, uh, uh, they were sent to Liverpool where my dad enlisted in the uh, Royal Norwegian Navy. He trained as a gunner at the uh, training center in Dumbarton, Scotland. And from there, he was assigned to merchant ships as a gunner um, and served the rest of the war. He served, the, like many of your fathers, served the entire five years of the uh, Norwegian occupation of Norway. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, 
about a year before he passed away, we were talking about D-Day. And I said, Dad, did you have anything to do with D-Day? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, we, uh, we sank some old ships to uh, create breakwaters and for the establishment of the mulberries, which were the temporary uh, harbors that, uh, that the allies would uh, unload the supplies. And I thought, if I had never asked him about that, I would never have known that he paid, uh, he and his comrades uh, had such an important part to play in the D-Day invasion. Um, so he was, uh, honorably discharged on September 21st, 1945, which was four months after the war. Um, when he finally arrived home in Norway, it was such a blessing because his, from my, if I remember correctly, I think my grandmother received the casualty of war notification. So she had no idea whether he was alive or, or dead until, uh, until the end of the war. So, and that's a photo of him and the Devangar, which is the ship he was stationed on when it was torpedoed. Right. Then it's John. Well, that's my dad. Uh, <laughs> we've talked about this before. It's it's almost a real challenge to describe his life. Uh, he's a young officer at the start of the war. He experiences three sinkings, but a number of other close calls. And, and uh, like Hank's father, he also participated in D-Day sinking a block ship. Um, and, um, but he, uh, he was hurt badly a couple of times and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and um, the worst, and the reason he finds himself actually in the history books after the war, and we can talk about this a little bit more detail later, but the Blink was a Norwegian ship torpedoed off of Cape Hatteras, February, 1942 in the middle of a gale about two in the morning, they're torpedoed. And um, one of the lifeboats uh, uh, is really badly damaged. They launch a small lifeboat, uh, 23 men get in the boat. And the next morning trying to sail, they're, they're on the edge of the Gulf Stream where the, uh, the, the, the water's heading uh, one direction and the wind's heading in another direction. And it created a really terrible situation and they rolled the lifeboat over and uh, all the gear fell out that they needed. Uh, one man drowned just as it rolled over, and uh, it was a lot of challenges to get it back up again. Uh, and they tried to bail the water out, but it was so stormy they couldn't. And the lifeboats are designed to float on air tanks when all else fails. So it was interesting. My father was also the radio operator on this ship. And as the blink was coming across the Atlantic, she actually went to uh, Tampa, Florida. Uh, and he had heard on the radio all of the sinkings that were taking place on the East Coast. This is February 1942, just after Pearl Harbor. Uh, the German U-boats had come in close. There's a real slaughter. Uh, Bill showed that video earlier that uh, where the people were watching the tankers burn up at night. And um, he knew this was coming. So he took the time to overhaul, overhaul all the safety equipment in the lifeboats. But uh, And the captain, as it turned out, <laughs> The captain led great parties ashore, uh, which uh, some of you would, you know, it's, I think might be synonymous with drinking heavily, <laughs> but, but they had a lot of good times ashore while this was happening. And within two weeks, the captain would be dead. So uh, maybe he had a sense of foreboding here, but the, the, the blink is torpedoed and um, with them in his lifeboat, they, uh, they're, they're floating there. Uh, the seas go all around them and, um, they have no food or water. And the first day goes by, okay. But the second day, they, one of the fellows starts to talk about taking a subway someplace. And an hour later, he's dead. And then the rest of the, that day and the next day, they lose a man almost every hour. Uh, so of the 23, 17 would perish. And then when they're finally rescued, my father took the time to, to write the final log of the blink, which captures these deaths every hour. And later after the war, this page and a half would be so uh, uh, of interest to historians that it would show up in dozens of Norwegian history books and even in, in European books, uh, British books as well. And it's just one of those things where every hour a man's dying, um, uh, the captain speaks a home and dies is what the log records. So they, they, they've really struggled. Uh, and later, as we were preparing for this, this um, 
talk, I was watching some interview tapes, and we'll see some of them later, hopefully, um, where he's talking about the time in the blink, and um, where the men turn to him, and he can't help them. And this, I watching this thing, I finally realized what a hole this had left in his heart all his life. So later, in the 1960s, he gets part of the war caught up to him in the late 60s. Uh, it started with nightmares and that type of thing, and then came to a massive heart attack. Um, and he was like three weeks in intensive care in the hospital in New York, and then another three weeks in the regular part of the hospital before he went home. So he was pretty well, had to just take care of himself. Uh, and um, he had been to Norway two years before and had heard about a new pension that was being made available. And uh, had seen a, two doctors over there who said, you know, you, you would qualify for this. So he applied for the pension and was turned down. So he started to think about this, study the law a lot more, and he applied a second time and was turned down. So he, 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 was, he was starting to feel a little bit better at this time. A year and a half had gone by. He took one more shot at it and applied to the highest court, appealed to the highest court and won. And then he knew more, it seemed, about the, he knew how the system worked, let's say, at that point. And so he began to help other sailors. And the more of these fellows he helped, and by the time he passes away in 96, he's done 600 cases. So a lot of these sailors just were not, let's say, the type of people who know how to fill out an application, you know, or filled it out the way that the, the people in Norway wanted to see it. He learned how to fill this thing out, and people started to come from Norway to help him. But what the system was basically an honest system, although the truth is there was this real negative aspect about the seamen in general. They had to overcome a serious stigma uh, uh, and, and, and to fight for everything that they got because it was just somehow they were like the forgotten, let's say, heroes of this whole thing. But they were also somewhat, let's say, very, very neglected in terms of, of, of the whole outcome of the war uh, and what happens when, you know, at the end. So anyway, helping these guys, he 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 just got his health back. And the more he did for them, the more it was. And the odd thing was he started to win these cases on appeal, which meant people were getting two to three years back pay. So checks for like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars were coming over. And of course that was a made a big difference for these families. But all of a sudden he found himself being really pressured by the Norwegian diplomatic community. And he got a letter that he was being investigated. Um, uh, there were some threatening calls and stuff. Uh, and, you know, it, it, you know, sort of wanting him to stop. And as I we got ready for this thing, I realized now, watching some of the videos of him, um, the fact that they gave him a hard time and made it difficult and made he had to fight for those men. Uh, and later he had to fight for the war pensions for the widows. Um, <laughs> By they basically did him a favor because the more he had to fight, the more he got his health back. So it's an odd circumstance. You never, never know when you be give, you're given a good turn in life. Anyway, next slide, please. This is some footage from the BBC uh, uh, Forgotten Heroes documentary. He's talking here about the sinking of the Norwegian ship Taranger, which was shelled and, and uh, machine gunned uh, before they got into the lifeboats. And then, um, and they fixed me all the clothes, the scoots in, because they come out. When they found the school and the song on us, or we were only clothed, or now they were your back mouth, or that comes somewhere in ratty motors. We thought I'm going to run us near. So I was over there in command of the room. I said, oh, 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 oh. So I came to the U-boat. But I was on the end. And so I came to the end. But I thought I had to go to the end. But it was the strong cars that ran and just came to the end. Uh, now here is this so that was the Tauranga, which was uh, early in the war uh, the ship is sank um it's interesting they had been in liverpool uh the ship had been in, in dry dock for a few days during the blitz and uh 
Uh, it was a pretty scary time. And then uh, when they left Liverpool, they could have joined a convoy. The captain decided not to. Um, and um, so like a day, two days out, they were chased by a submarine during the day. And then at night, that submarine caught up with them and uh, uh, shelled them and, and, and really messed, just fired lots of machine gun bullets and all sorts of things into them. And then finally torpedoed them. But my father was uh, the radio operator and the mate, and he he got the SOS message out, but uh, he was ordered to hold the lifeboat uh, for the captain and the chief engineer. So he was actually on the side of the ship with a lifeboat waiting for them uh, on, on the side where the submarine was, uh, was firing from. So just as they were waiting, suddenly the chief engineer dove off the ship into the sea. And the reason he dove off was he had been badly wounded and he couldn't manage the ladder. So my father asked him, where's the captain? And he said the last shell had blown the captain's head off. So he wasn't coming. Um, the mate would, the, 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 the chief engineer would end up in a hospital in Iceland for almost a year and then later perish, would freeze to death in a lifeboat uh, trying to get back to the States on another ship that's torpedoed. So these are pretty harrowing times to say the least. Now this, this part of the video, he's talking about the time in the blink, uh, the lifeboat of the blink, um, when things are getting very difficult, it's a, like I say, it's a storm. Uh, it's, they haven't got any food or water, and they're sitting basically in the sea at this time. Uh, maybe you can, it's, can we sit, start, the, start the video, please? So sat we there, and held us fast. We had a mighty hold us fast for that the boat and sling with you all, sure it over. Then Kalle uh, Norman lost the field. Og uh, jeg sitter der og ser på det, og vi ene etter den andre dør. Og jeg tror nå kanskje det også skal hende til deg. Og hva jeg tenkte på alle de hjemme. Og hva jeg var redd for at jeg skulle miste for Stan selv. Til og med en mann som ville kle, kle av seg og spore for en, en reaksjon. <laughs> Siden jeg var styrmann, så tror han også at jeg, han var vant med at uh, det ville gjøre en reaksjon for mot sykdom. Så han kledde av seg og, og hadde satt seg i sjøen. Og så skal de og rystet de, og så vi holdt de på, på de, og de så døde, til og med kaptein i båten døde. Og det så så trist ut. En etter en. Det var 17 mann i alt. På samme måte mellom mellom en times mellomrom. Let me go to the next slide, yeah. Now this is one that the Norwegian Broadcasting System did uh, in 1994. Um, the, um, basically, they're talking again about the log of the blink here, but uh, this is done in Brooklyn. Now, I think later we'll get a chance to talk about the importance of Brooklyn in World War II and how it's helped sustain the crews of these ships. I mean, Brooklyn is, at the time, I think the third largest Norwegian city in the world. <laughs> and it has a real role. My father, after the blink, he spends time with a Norwegian family. Um, and um, it's kind of a uh, an interesting situation. So, so the, I think the NRK, the Norwegian Broadcasting System, recognized in the 90s the importance of Brooklyn. So he's filmed in Bay Ridge looking out at the sea here. And um, what's interesting too, when he passed away, at the funeral, a, a really nice looking woman came up to me with a very eloquently dressed. And she said she knew my father from when she was a young girl in Brooklyn. Uh, he had been, her father was an Italian tailor and he would make my father's uniforms. And she said, your father frequently needed new uniforms. And that's because every time the ship was sunk, he, he had to get new clothes. So it occurred to me, because he was pretty much financially strapped out, broke at these times. and. Somebody in Brooklyn had to vouch for him and give him credit. 
So that, I think that's sort of the what I call an untangible support mechanism, because he certainly couldn't have gone, I don't think, to the Norwegian government to get a new uniform at that time. <laughs> At any rate, Brooklyn plays a pre-roll. Now, this is going to be in Norwegian. So I don't know. Is everyone OK with that? It's it's um, I think I think it's about four minutes long. Um, and it ends on an interesting note where he's talking about the men. All right. Uh, there's a narrator who's reading the, the log. And, and then he's inter interjecting at times in it. Um, and um, this is the one I was watching when I realized how important helping the other sailors was to him getting better. Uh, you want to send it? Uh, start it. I over 50 år har han levd med onsdag 11. februar 1942. Då blink gick ner i Nordatlanten efter tre torpedotreff. Fem man döde momentant. To drev bort på en flåte. 23 samlar sig i styrbord livbåt. Vi måste då balansera när en båt är full av man. Så är det så lätt för kanter så vi måste sitta och balansera och det är tre att ju man i en båt. Och men vi kan inte nå igen. Och rätt att han upp igen. Han berga passet sitt, första styrmannen som skulle komma till och loggföra en av de mest tragiska livbåtsseglarsar under hela den andra världskrigen. Torsdag 12 februar. Klockan 17 blev lätt matros Larsen sinnsvak och död. Klockan 18.30 blev lätt matros Vinter sinnsvak och död. Klokken 19 blev tredje styrman Johansen sin svak og død. Det var liksom en slags søgdom og smittesøgdom. De tøyse og tull, de visste ikke hvor de var hen. De trodde de var fremdeles på en sjatt og ville ha seg en glass øl og varm kaffe og ville la seg ned i en seng. Noen sa at de ville ha en taxi opp til hotellet, you know. Klokken 21 ble kokk Eriksen sinnsvak og død. Klokken 22 ble lett matros George sinnsvak og død. Klokken 22.30 ble lett matros Salin sinnsvak og død. Vi holdt på dem så lenge de kunne. Men du kan se det i går, vi så det hvite skum og møn deres. Og det var ikke lenge etterpå så døde de. Fredag 13. februar. Klokken ett ble lempet Danos sinnsvak og døde. Klokken tre ble kaptein Ulvestad sinnsvak og døde. Så det var det en, en mann kom til og med over, og han var styrmann, så trodde han at jeg hadde medisiner for injeksjon, og ville ha injeksjon ombord, injeksjon i kroppen. Og uh, han, uh, han uh, kledde av seg for å få det, så men han uh, kledde av seg og slang seg ned i båten igjen, og så var jeg full av vann. Klokken 4.30 ble tredje maskinist Sørensen sinnsvak og døde. Klokken 5 ble andre maskinist Johansen sinnsvak og døde. Klokken 7 ble kanoner White sinnsvak og døde. Det er til og med jeg dør så av i døgnblikk, og da, når jeg kom til igjen, så så jeg krigsskyv i horisonten. Og hvite, det var hvite. Og det var helt flott. Og det forstår jeg ikke. Jeg kan til og med se det bildet i dag. Det er stille i mitt syn. Lørdag 14. februar. Klokken 4.30 ble fyrbøter kvia sinnsvak og døde. Klokken 7 ble matros plum sinnsvak og døde. Klokken ni ble matros hendum sinnsvak og død. Det sterkeste, det sterkeste overlevde. Men, uh... 
Klokken elleve ble fyrbøtta Larsen sinnsvak og død. Klokken tolv ble andre styrmann Feit sinnsvak og død. Håpet. Så lenge du har håpet. Håpet. Så, men hvis du mister håpet, så mister du også ja, for mange livet. Men det var, det var håpet. Og det, det kom til slutt. I think most of us, I hope you got the gist of that. Uh, so, uh, in the last little bit he's saying there is that uh, Whoop. Okay. Okay, hold on. All right, well, um, I think it's maybe Phil's turn to speak now. I mean, uh, the last bit of that video, I hope most people got it. The the gist of it was a, a review of what the, the British had copied, uh, the BBC had done. But at the same time, I think the, uh, the reading about the log, each hour a man dying. But the one little piece at the end there that, that I think is the most powerful message is the power of hope. Yeah. When a man lost hope, then came the end. Um, and that's when your situation like that, you don't know how important hope is. And so my father always believed that uh, you had to keep your morale up and try to keep focused and think positive. <laughs> and uh, although he was tested, uh, as few people were tested. Uh, but the war, the time after the war, uh, in, in the late 70s, uh, uh, early 70s, and, and that time on, they uh, things start to happen. And the sailors start to come together. They start winning pensions. And they start uh, being supportive of each other. I think, Phil, you were going to talk about this part? Yes. So um, I think in the late 70s, um, the Norwegian government uh, decided to award um, the war medals to all the war sailors. Um, so I think this is a photo from I, probably the one of the first, if not the first ceremonies uh, that was done in uh, New York City. So um, at that time, uh, seven war sailors uh, came to accept their medals. So what's on the left is their certificate my dad got, and then on the right is the actual medal. And uh, in the uh, center there is a picture of him with uh, uh, after the award ceremony, and then the uh, consul uh, general George Thestrup was right there to the uh, right, who awarded this medal. So, if you can go to the next slide, um, the Norwegian uh, newspaper in Brooklyn was the Nortus Tidna, so they had an article about the uh, award ceremony. And so there's a photo of the, the seven gentlemen. So you could see uh, John's father all the way on the left. You kind of my dad's in the middle. Um, so it just it just relating what what happened. Um, and then some kind words John's father had <laughs> for uh, Norway. And and um, I I always thought it was kind of nice at the end. At, they said Walter Erickson and his orchestra provided the uh, musical entertainment at the, at the end. So <laughs> for those who are from Brooklyn, everyone, you wouldn't recognize the name Walter Erickson. <laughs> so I, I guess you can go to the next slide. And so this is, I think, illustrating uh, John's point, uh, uh, connecting Norwegian war sailors in the United States. Uh, and it was through social gatherings, uh, the creation of advocacy organization, and then also newsletters. So there were two associations that were created, one for those who were uh, Norwegian Navy war veterans, 
And then there was ones that was war sailors. They were the merchant seamen. So my dad was part of both organizations because he was both a merchant seaman and then he uh, transferred to the Norwegian Navy to be a gunner on a merchant ship. So on the left, you see a photo from one of their many parties uh, from 1989. And again, you can see John's father kind of in the center, standing in the center. Uh, my father is uh, third from the right. And um, I think Hank's father is, is somewhere in that picture too. Yeah, he is. And then on the right is a photo of one of um, maybe the one of the last meetings that the uh, Norwegian Navy War Veterans Group had. Uh, they would always have a, a reunion or a meeting in um, Williams Lake in the Catskills, where they would socialize and and uh, talk about the 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 old days and support each other and things like that. And uh, the wives were also invited too. We go to the next slide. So this was a program from the 25th anniversary uh, dinner party for the uh, Norwegian uh, merchant seamen. And uh, it gives a little history of the club. You can see it was first started in 1971 and then formalized in 1973. And if you know, John's looks. John's father was basically the president almost <laughs> the entire time this this party took place uh, in 1996. Um, so uh, I just highlight two. Uh, hopefully, you know. Uh, funny things. One is that uh, on the left side, you see that they had an open bar. <laughs> so no, no cash bar. And they always uh, had some sort of uh, musical entertainment at these events where there would be lots of fun and dancing. So Sonia Dalit was also another prominent uh, Norwegian American entertainer in the Brooklyn area. So the next slide. And so I think John, these are a couple of um, videos from uh, award ceremonies in later years. This one looks like it's from 1990. Yeah, this was a big event. They, they, I think they finally got most of them together. And it was a medal, I think, called the King's Medal that was given out that day. And this is in Fort Hamilton Park, uh, Fort Hamilton Brooklyn's Officers Club. Um, the uh, I don't know who the man behind the mic is, but the the one fa the man facing us is is uh, the uh, Council General uh, John Bornaby. He went on to become the ambassador for many years to Japan for Norway. So he was a, a very and a great a friend of, and and supporter of the sailors uh, throughout the years he was in New York.
And this one, you might just want to show the, the picture. But <laughs> these are these are all the war sailors um, gathered for a group photo. Looks like on the patio of the Officers Club at Fort Hamilton. Yeah, but the, uh, the bridge in the background there. Yeah, they uh, they would party hardy after this too. By the way, <laughs> there's a real sense of healing I think going on at this point and fellowship. It had come like 1990s, a long time after the war. <laughs> Um, and we may want to uh, skip, uh, pass through some of these. Um, this, uh, yeah, there was always a um, contingent of war sailors that marched in the 17th of May parade uh, held in Brooklyn. Um, so I think this one you'll see um, them trying to gather before the actual parade started. For many years, they would use a lifeboat as a float. Um, and it was made by this company, the Lane Lifeboat Company, which was based in Brooklyn. Um, and, they, and that company had made lifeboats for them during the war, too. I don't know if that's the lifeboat, but hey, yeah. we don't need to see this one. This is just marchers. Um, I just wanted to throw these uh, two next two slides that I used uh, last time. But it just illustrates that war sailors uh, uh, were, had always participated in these 17th of May parades. I, this might have been the first one in 1944. Uh, so you see the upper photo is actually, uh, it, I'm going by what how the slide is identified as um, uh, shipmates of the Norwegian Merchant Marine. Uh, the dignitaries on the on the bottom is a rear admiral in the U.S. Navy, um, but the gentleman second, um, well, the gentleman on the far right, I believe he's with the Siemens Church, but the gentleman next to him, uh, second from the right, is Dr. Liam, who eventually was my father's boss at the Norwegian Public Health Service. So we can go to the next slide, and you'll just see more shots of um, uh, Norwegian merchant uh, seamen marching in the in the parade and uh, call to your attention the center one which is uh, um, Royal Norwegian Navy uh, trainees at the gunnery school in Travers Island in the Bronx. So the gunnery training mission shifted from Camp Norway in Nova Scotia to Travers Island in in uh, June of 1943, um, but it, because most of the convoys kind of originated in off uh, New York Harbor by that time, and then uh, by 1940, uh, by July of 1944, this gunnery school was also closed because then the whole mission shifted to uh, Dunbarton in Scotland because I think they had enough uh, gunners on merchant ships by this time. So you can go to the next slide. Um, this is one of the uh, monuments in the United States uh, dedicated to remembering the sacrifice of uh, Norwegian merchant seamen and Navy personnel. Uh, it was originally dedicated in 1982. This is in Battery Park in the tip of uh, Manhattan Island. Um, so it was moved in uh, 2005. So here is the king coming for a uh, rededication ceremony. And uh, my father got to represent uh, the Royal Norwegian Navy uh, World War II veterans. So you could see him there 
in the tan trench coat and little baseball cap. Then afterwards of the ceremony, um, all the Norwegian veterans that were there gathered with the uh, New York City Police Honor Guard. This, these were, um, that were uh, providing the security for the Kings. And um, all of these uh, police officers are, were of Scandinavian descent. Uh, I believe they are part of something called the Viking Battalion there in uh, New York. Go to the next slide. Yeah, this was a slide I wanted to make after seeing the slides from Battery Park, because I am um, in the last 15, 20 years, there has been a lot of new monuments in Norway commemorating the, the war sailors. Uh, you see all these places, uh, different types of monuments. Most of them has been raised by private people, institution, uh, not private. Not uh, not the state or the counties, but uh, private initiatives behind most of these monuments. But uh, possibly the most important one is the ship that you see here. It's called Hestman. It's a ship that sailed in b both the second, first, and the second world war uh, for Norway, and is now a war sailor museum, but also a monument of. Uh, the seafarers from both world wars. And then you have this monument in Fana, John. Would you speak about? Yeah, that's a memorial for my father uh, when he yeah. passed away in 1996 at the, the Fana Church Hall, which is the community hall behind the church. They uh, Two local artists created sort of a textile art um, Sort of, sim which was supposed to be symbolic of his life. He had many adventures in his youth and then in the war, and they created this beautiful work of art, uh, which was dedicated back in in '96. And this summer, I got to take uh, my grandchildren there, so that my four grandchildren are looking at his memorial. <laughs> and uh, it's a very special moment for all of us uh, to see the memorial there. But it stresses that uh, he was the, the the war sailor is one of the, the plaque will say, and uh, born there. And this was the church where he was born and baptized, and the school was actually attached to it when he grew up. And uh, and of course, he had a funeral there too. So it's uh, uh, we were very uh, the, the the fact that this one space was available for us was was uh, it worked out very beautifully to to place this memorial there. And um, in Norway, the um, the increased awareness of the war sailors the last fifteen years uh, also resulted that we, in my institution, the Archivet, um, wanted to make a digital monument uh, to commemorate, but also to document the history of all uh, the Norwegian seafarers, but also the foreign seafarers on Norwegian ships. Uh, so that's the reason why we so far have, have registered 70,000 uh, seafarers uh, and also more than 5,000 ships. Um, this is a site called Krigsseile Registra, which means uh, War Sailor Registry in English. And um, I will just briefly tell you what you can find there because you can enter the site um, on the internet afterwards and look for yourself. Uh, here is one thing you can uh, go into and see the map of all the ships when Norwegian seafarers uh, were uh, located when their ship was sunk. Uh, and uh, as you see, it was especially in the Atlantic Ocean where a lot of ships went down during the war. And then you can click on the different ships and learn more about what happened to it and and what crews that were on, on board when it took place. Uh, every single seafarer that we have registered have this kind of page where we document uh, data from the person, um, person data, but also uh, information about uh, the person's service in the Second World War. Uh, which ships he sailed on, medals he received. We can also receive, if we receive images from relatives, we can post that. Uh, and also, uh, uh, yeah, 
documents like diaries or letters that children or grandchildren want to to share with us. And yes, here you can see uh, John's father's which ships he sailed on. And uh, I think something that really has uh, interested many people has been the possibility to to read the maritime inquiries that we have digitized and connected to every seaman that has been going through a shipwreck. Um, so then you can read, uh, and this, this is often written in English. So it is possible also for English readers to, to read a lot of, of those inquiries. Um, and something that um, by register this into a database, we are managing to get some new information about who the war sailors were. And we are not finished yet, but we have finished those who sailed for the uh, Norwegian fleet, who sailed for the Allies, for a ship. And this shows that there were about 30,000 Norwegians and 30,000 foreigners. Though the foreigners did never um, constitute more than 25% of the total crew because they were on board on a shorter time than the Norwegians. We also found more than 350 women that sailed on Norwegian ships. Uh, the greatest foreign group uh, was the British, more than 14,000 British seamen. A lot of the, them were gunners, of course. And we have managed to document that nearly 5,000 died during the Second World War uh, that sailed on Norwegian ships. That doesn't mean that they were killed uh, at sea, everybody, but they died of different reasons. Some of them at sea, but also a lot of them died by sickness, uh, more indirectly perhaps because of the war. Yeah. That was the very, very short version of Kriegsheilerregister, uh, which is <laughs> a difficult word in Norwegian and even more difficult for non-Norwegian speaking people, I, I presume. Yeah, and that was the end of our presentation. Yes, I thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to open this up for questions and comments from the group. Hello, uh, this is Paul Rood. And um, I did um, um, term papers in graduate school at the University of Wisconsin on the Norwegian Merchant Marine, one on World War One and one on World War Two. And I thought it was interesting, the parallels between the two, because in World War I, Norway likewise had the world's fourth largest merchant marine. And likewise, half of it was sunk in the war by the Germans. And, um, and so this was a huge, um, this was a huge deal. I, I just, um, I, I just wonder, uh, Perhaps this needs some study. When I did my term paper, there was already a massive 400 page book on the subject of the Norwegian Merchant Marine in World War I, talking about this. But I wonder if there might be uh, um, thousands of more stories out there that perhaps need to be collated or perhaps some um, attention given to also. Um, so half of the Norwegian Merchant Marine was sunk. I wonder if that's one of the reasons they had so many new ships in time for World War II, so many tankers, because having lost so many old ships, they were able to uh, buy into the newest trends. That's all I have. Thank you. I think Bjorn is doing a lot of uh, work on uh, uh, creating this, and, uh, and there's room for a lot of more contributions. Yeah, Should I give a sh I can give a short answer because it's an interesting <laughs> question you have, Paul. 
there hasn't been very much written about this First World War in Norway because it's the Second World War that takes most of uh, the focus uh, here. Um, and it's very often forgotten that uh, the Norwegian seafarers, uh, about 2,000 of those were, were actually killed in this First World War. Um, the reason why uh, the, the tankers were that modern is, I, I'm not an expert on uh, the shipping policy, but possibly because they were so late to to transition from sail to steam. Yes. Uh, poss possibly they were eager to be more uh, quickly to uh, um, to adapt to the to the new situation where the steamship were um, uh, tr the transfer over to motor ships. Um, <laughs> um, so that's possibly one of the reasons uh, why, and also I think. Uh, the Norwegian shipping uh, uh, companies were at this time they were very uh, eager to to be a modern um, fleet. Uh, also, not not least in the Eastern Oceans, a lot of Norwegian ship, shipping companies. Uh, had ships going on in Asia on the China trade, uh, so it it was a very outlooking kind of uh, business, I believe. But uh, um, I haven't any better answer than that. Sorry. I, well, I, noticed, I, um, yeah. I noticed that um, uh, the Norwegian government participated in the rebuilding of the fleet after World War One. And they may well have done so after World War II as well. In other words, to help the shipping companies make up for the fantastic losses they suffered. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I agree. Um, by losing a lot of ships in the First World War, they received money from insurance to buy new ships in the uh, 1920s. So that's, that's a good... Uh, a good possibility. Uh, after the Second World War, the Norwegian ship owners also received a lot of money from insurance and also from neutral ship. Uh, so they, this gave the poss good possibilities for the shipping companies to grow also after the World War II. Yeah. yeah I might say something. My, my father's story was that, uh, well, I, I think it's difficult, unless you grew up in the, it, with all this stuff, the the shipping was so important to Norway. Like my father is basically sent out. He's got uh, five siblings. He's sent out basically to earn money to help them, you know? And I think that's true for most of, of the sailors. They're sending back money that's very, very important to a country that's pretty poor at this time. But the ship owners were very clever businessmen, very serious. Uh, and uh, his story was that during the depression, they could, they could buy ships exceptionally cheap and they had the money or could get the money to buy ships during the depression um so they were investing um and one of the things i think he, the reason he survives the war in part all those sinkings is he's very well trained i mean and uh and the ships are well equipped they actually have a lot of emergency equipment uh, modern things um and and so these are these are businesses that are investing in in the better technology and things like that so the tankers you know, it just turned out that they happened to uh, pick that time to make their investments, uh, and and it worked out. You know, for the it was a, a God saving thing for the British. Yeah. Um, and and just to add two cents, I mean, it was also um, with the tankers. I mean, you have to understand that both the automobile and the aviation industry was just starting to grow. Um, you know, it was. Not a lot, you know, before World War One, uh, but then when you're getting into the twenties, um, there's more need for aviation fuel, which you know then spurs investment in uh, buying tankers, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, Edward has his hand raised. Do you have a comment or question? 
Yes, thank you. Very interesting presentation. I, I appreciate it. And I did some research last summer on World War II in Norway, the occupation. And I was just wondering for the war sailors and their families, were there any repercussions from the Gestapo or the the Norwegian, the, the, the Nazi Norwegian under Quisling, the police that uh, those at home, in other words, when when uh, were there investigations that the names of sailors and their families that were somehow the families back in Norway, were there any uh, persecution or arrests made by the Gestapo because they were war sailors? Thank you. I may answer that. Um, it, it wasn't any that kind of reactions, but um, in 1940, when ships went down and medals were uh, provided to the seafarers, this could result that uh, money was held back to the seafarers' family uh, by the Nazi regime. So that was one reason that this kind of information was not uh, made public in Britain uh, in late 1940-41, I believe, uh, to, to ensure that people back home were not suffered economically. But I, I do not know about any people that were interrogated or arrested because of... Um, their family members being war sailors. One note: the uh, it was mentioned in the mulberries, and those were uh, artificial harbors that were created by the British during the Normandy invasion, and they were pretty critical uh, because uh, in the uh, invasion depended on having enough supplies to uh, meet the German uh, counterattack, and it's generally conceded. I think it's generally conceded. Without the uh, mulberries, the uh, overall invasion would probably have failed, as far as we can tell. Um, and the uh, very, very good presentation, guys. I really like the inclusion of the films, and uh, it's really good that this. I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces in World War II, and a lot of people were involved. But one of the critical elements, I think everybody agrees, is the Battle of Britain and the ability of uh, Britain to face the uh, Nazi threat and the importance, uh, clearly, of the uh, Norwegian tankers. And one thing is that German uh, captains, U-boat captains, were raided and praise for their tonguey, tonnage sunk. And the biggest ships out there were the tankers. So they were the, if the German U-boat uh, captain saw a uh, fleet, he would go directly for the tankers because of the uh, high tonnage. So any other thoughts? Well, one thing I about the tankers, to... the, uh, they put deck cargo on them on top of they once they got the fuel in them they also loaded a deck cargo on top of the tanker so it was like and the income for i was always told from the deck cargo went to the norwegian government uh and typically throughout the war they dramatically overloaded the vessels the, the chances of being sunk by a submarine was seen as much greater than being lost in a storm so they would go way over there was the 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 top the the, the the safe tonnage level uh, try to get double the amount of cargo on a ship just because each time they got one across it was a big deal. I mean, I think one of the reasons that a lot of this recent interest in the movies and stuff out of Norway is that the historians are slowly, takes the stories a long time to sort of digest and sort things out. Something as big as World War II, as you're saying, uh, Bill, is just really difficult to get your hands around. But now I'm reading historians saying the Battle of, La of the Atlantic was the critical battle, that it was pretty much mismanaged, uh, and that if it had been handled better, uh, the war could have been a year shorter. So there's a, a real issue, you know, and my dad used to say the the people just thought that the, the equipment showed up, you know, they didn't realize the, the challenge to get it there, you know. <laughs> um, I was going to say that uh, what you said is very true because uh, Churchill, uh, in one of his books, 
says that the only time he was really worried was during the Battle of the Atlantic. Yeah. That's uh, he, he kind of knew that they wouldn't be able to invade England from from the continent, and uh, um, so he's he's certainly very much into that. I must say also that uh, growing up in Norway in the 50s and 60s, it's true that at the time there was very little talk about it. Uh, I had a friend, his name was Per Strand, and his father Strand, and you guys may have run into him, was very active in that and working for the government. He was an officer, but he also he dealt with divorce sellers. But to me, the big, uh, and this is very <laughs> personal, not not maybe that important, but uh, or obviously not that important. But the first time I really felt that there was a change in the attitude towards all of that was when that book came out, which was called Every Tenth Man Had to Die. And I think that was the first time we, and of course, me as a young boy, that you suddenly realized that. Because until that time, and you know, especially for little boys, the exciting thing was the pilots and, you know, destroyers and all that stuff, you know, being on a tanker wasn't seen as, uh, you know, we didn't, um, of course, we didn't understand the big picture, but uh, but that book to me is also one of those World War II books, at least in a recent context, which really kind of turned the whole, the whole way you look at those years, which were not that far away when, when I grew up. So, I had an interesting experience last summer. One of my cousins who could remember my father returning in 1946, he was telling me that uh, despite all the things my father had been through, he was very healthy and quite fit. And uh, and uh, he was actually going to, my father went back to go to the captain school. He felt that contrasted with the sailors coming back that were coming back right into Norway. And he felt the difference was that my father had now an American family that had supported him during the war. Mm -hmm. uh, and what was interesting was he went on to talk about um, um, the, 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 the family, like my, my father's wounded on the, when the Oregon Express is, is sunk and he ends up getting some major surgery on his back. And my grandfather, who was a retired New York City policeman, brought him home from uh, the hospital and uh, to live in a house in Staten Island. And all of the neighbors, I guess, got involved because this cousin in Norway could tell me the names of neighbors long dead, <laughs> who I guess had, at the end of the war, had sent stuff. And my mother went over in 46, um, and they they had, uh, my grandfather had connections with the uh, uh, black market, so they were able to get 10 large crates of food to take on the ship with her, and and lots of clothing, which my grandmother then gave out to the community there. And... Uh, so he knew all the names of people and such, and and I, I suddenly realized the involvement of that sort of Norwegian American community and and um, uh, and, and helping out there. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a different sort. But his perspective was the, the unfortunately the sailors returning to Norway who hadn't were in bad shape were coming back to a country that had been occupied for five years and had gone through some terrible things, um, and then sailors just still still didn't have that sort of an image of of, of you know positive thing. Uh, and of course, they were all dealing with sort of post-trauma and, and many other difficulties, uh, medical-wise. Um, so it was an awkward, tough time. But he felt the American experience on a, on a whole. And I wonder, maybe Phil and uh, your dad also had benefited from being in the states. Yes, um, I I think there was a huge uh, support network. Obviously, relatively speaking, there was probably more wealth here. You know in America and maybe Brooklyn specifically, you know, like uh, on my mother's side, my grandfather worked in the Brooklyn Navy Yard and it was a big improvement from scrounging around during the depression, looking for work. Um, so they were uh, well off, relatively speaking. Um, you know, they had a place to live and all, but the other unsung hero in all this is uh, the Siemens Church. Right. Um, so adjacent in in Brooklyn, adjacent to the Siemens Church was something called the Siemens House. So I think that was like a temporary living quarters for seamen while they were waiting a new assignment. But I mean, that house, uh, my father recalls, was, you know, like always full. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in fact, he served for a, like a nine month period as kind of like a a college, uh, you know, resident assistant, you know, um, uh, 
dorm monitor or whatever. Um, but those that Siemens house was often full. And so um, it, a Norwegian uh, family, or Norwegian American families would often ha say, here, uh, I've got a couch you can crash on or, or something else uh, as a little safety net for the Norwegian seamen waiting for a um, new ship assignment. Mm -hmm. And I think the Siemens church also provided um, kind of a, a spiritual and uh, a moral morale support for the for the seamen there was it was kind of like the USO for Norway in in a sense you know there would always be social gatherings uh you know there would be ministers that would uh, you know host uh, services uh so there were a lot of things uh to occupy the social time of or the free time of sailors uh, in between uh, assignments and then if they they decided to stay in New York for a while. That was a natural home base uh, for them to branch out. So like in my father's case, at the end of the war, he contacted his family like he was excited, uh, the possibility of going back. And uh, his family wrote back saying, uh, basically, if you got a job in America, stay there because there's there's really nothing going on here in, in Norway. And you could tell by the number of no young Norwegian men Coming over to America in the you know late forties and fifties, they were like uh, the laborers of the day. Uh, they were the ones building like all the suburban homes in Levittown, New York, et cetera, <laughs> and in northern New Jersey, um, upstate New York. Um, so Norwegians were coming to America looking for work at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know uh, three of the past presidents of Washington Lodge were Norwegians who were in the United States and decided to stay here or were told by the relatives, stay there, where there's nothing nothing for you here. And, uh, and the, but the Washington Lodge was formed in 1943 during the war and one of its main activities was supporting Norwegians uh, who were in the United States. I know the Baltimore Seaman Church and the Baltimore Lodge were very involved because, of course, Baltimore was, was, was and still is an important port. And this provided um, support and contact with the Norwegians, uh, sailors and other Norwegians in the States during the time. Um, I apologize for the confusion about the Zooms. That won't happen again. For those who end up late, I'm sure you will try to get the uh, video on the YouTube channel so you can uh, listen to the parts that you missed. Uh, we're going to have a very good program in April. Uh, and Janet, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, Chris Humphreys is going to talk about his mother. He is my narrator for all three of my Norwegian novels set during World War II. And we met at a couple of historical novel conferences a couple of years ago, and he suddenly realized he's asking me questions about my research, in particular, the naval British intelligence maps I could get at my uh, local college library. And it turned out his mother was in the resistance. So he's going to be talking about his mother, who was Inga Gerd Holter. And the Holter family were actually a very well-known theatrical family in Oslo, and uh, Chris's family, uh, his, he's British, his dad was an RAF pilot, and uh, they were also a theatrical family in England. But anyway, um, she was 1936 Oslo princess. She won the beauty contest and came to the attention of Gabriel Smith, who had started, uh, his older brother had started the bell ships uh, in Oslo. So he's going to be talking about it. Right now, he's in Serbia doing a book tour because uh, his latest book is in uh, in Serbian. I'm going to try that. Uh, but uh, anyway, it should be a really good talk. Uh, his brother uh, is lives in Canada. Chris also lives just north of me uh, you know, on Salt Spring Island, which is off the coast of Vancouver, B.C. So he'll be back. He's coming back the first week of April. But it should be a really interesting talk. Um, his brother belongs to a Canadian um, 
equivalent of the Sons of the Norway Lodge up there. And he gave a talk on that a couple of years ago. So it should be very interesting how she got involved through Gabriel Smith and the Bell Ships uh, into actually becoming a courier uh, in the early days of the resistance. So it should be a really interesting talk. And Chris seems, uh, or CC as he said, he's a <laughs> swordsman, an actor, a writer. He seems to be a very entertaining individual. I think it'd be a very good, I think it'd be okay. a very good talk. He's very entertaining. He's been on Coronation Street, all kinds of shows in Canada, in the UK. And he's also, uh, you know, been acting in the, in, um, in BC here too. So it should be, he's a lot of fun. He's, he's just the co coolest guy. I'm really very fortunate. He's my narrator, but he's also a friend. And uh, I think you'll really enjoy him. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for saying up. Uh, is there any more comments on the program or World War II in general or thoughts? So, uh, oh, again, Bill, I, yeah. I just wanted to amplify what uh, was mentioned a little before because there was more than just the number of Norwegian seamen that were killed, but there were about 6,000 that were wounded, sick or wounded. Um, and then some of those did uh, eventually perish. So there are some sites in in America, like if you go to the Adirondacks and Saranac Lake, that's where a lot of Norwegian seamen who contracted tuberculosis were sent there to cure cottages mm -hmm. um, to recover from uh, tuberculosis. Um, my father had pneumonia, so he was sent to, to a hospital in the Catskills, but anyway, there's a cemetery there. Um, uh, there are 16 uh, seamen who uh, uh, didn't survive tuberculosis. They're buried there. Um, and that part of the cemetery is, you know, maintained every year by uh, the Norwegian government. Hmm. It's it's more than just, you know, sinking in the, uh, uh, you know, in the ocean or being torpedoed. You could have contracted some uh, horrible disease and, he died in the service of your country. Yeah. Uh, very true. Any other comments? So uh, thank you for, I'd like to thank uh, 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 Bjorn for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank John, Phil, and, and Hank for your uh, comments and willingness to share your family stories. I'd like to thank everybody for participation and Hope to uh, see you guys at the uh, next meeting. So, and if you have suggestions for meetings, I'd, I'd like to hear them. So, uh, any uh, last comments? Thanks, you guys. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Great talk. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.